Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Stuff I Never Told You, a production of iHeartRadio. And welcome to another edition of Book Club, Pride Month edition. Although we we do talk about this stuff all the time. Right. So, uh, I will say this is a pretty recent book. It came out in 2016. Uh, so spoilers if you haven't read it. Uh, we are talking about Gabby Rivera's 2016 book, Juliet Takes a Breath. It is an award-winning book. It's really highly reviewed that it was partially inspired by Rivera's own coming out and feminist journey at the age of 19. And it is a really great coming out story. It's a great coming of age story. It's a great figuring out your whole deal story. It has themes of family, of being Puerto Rican in America, of trying to like learn and grow, but also realizing what doesn't work with you and and finding your own voice. By the way, we have talked about Gabby Rivera before because she also wrote the solo series America about America Chavez for mm-hmm. Marvel. Um, so we've done two episodes on America Chavez. Check those out. <laughs> <laughs> Who is, and this is a quote from Rivera's website, a portal punching queer Latina powerhouse. So uh, also uh, Rivera hosts Joy Uprising, which is a podcast that, quote, brings together her favorite revolutionary humans to honor joy in a chaotic world. So that's cool. And this work was adapted into a graphic novel. And we were just talking about that. Uh, I don't think that episode has come out yet, but we were just talking about how we enjoy graphic novels that don't um, necessarily fit into what you might think a graphic novel should look like. So I think that's really cool. Uh, So Let us get into the plot. This story largely follows queer Latinx teen Juliet, who has grown up in the Bronx, surrounded by her family, like has never left the Bronx. Uh, During her first year of college, she discovered the book Raging Flower, Empowering Your Pussy by Empowering Your Mind by Portland, Oregon-based white feminist Harlow Brisbane. Or Brisbane. Uh, It was a really important book to her, so she writes to Harlow. That's how the book opens explaining how much it impacted her, how many questions she has, and asks for an internship. Harlow offers her one for college credits uh, where Juliet would be helping with Harlow's next book. At the same time, Juliet is struggling with deciding whether or not to come out as a lesbian to her family. She is in love with her girlfriend, and she it's weighing on her that she hasn't come out. Uh, She does come out the night before she leaves for Portland, and it has mixed results, uh, but especially her mom is not cool with it, calling it a phase and kind of walking away and closing herself off. So Juliet goes to Portland, is picked up at the airport by Harlow, who is immediately like a hippie astrology aura white woman. Um, From here, we learn that Juliet has anxiety and asthma. And when Harlow changes the assignment to, uh, it's still for the book, but she changes the assignment to to tracking down women based on scraps of information that Harlow has collected over time. Juliet freaks out, uh, only compounded by the hostility of another person staying with Harlow named Finn and the general lack of people of color. Juliet does her best tracking the women on these scraps, developing an interest in the librarian, Kira, At the same time, her girlfriend is avoiding her, uh, not answering her texts or calls. Juliet is introduced to a lot of new ideas and terms, and Harlow takes her to an Octavia Butler writing class where uh, Juliet writes a sci-fi story and then witnesses an awkward encounter with Harlow lecturing other white women. Maxine, a black woman who is in a poly relationship with Harlow, asks Juliet about it later. Uh, eventually things culminate into Harlow using Juliet in a racist, tokenist way to prove she is uh, what she as a white feminist has done um, and has done the work. Juliet panics at being used like this and by by someone she respected. And she books a flight to Miami to see her cousin Ava, who has long been telling her to come come visit and they can talk about all these big ideas. 
There, Juliet reconnects with her aunt, who her mother claimed was gay, <laughs> and Ava, who answers her questions about a whole host of intersectional feminist topics. And Ava takes uh, Juliet to a party for queer people of color. While there, Juliet feels happy and free. She leaves her ex a message because, yes, by this point, they have broken up. It was like a letter <laughs> that her ex sent her. It was like, I found someone else. Uh, we're broken up. And then her ex responded again and was like, I made a huge mistake. I'm so sorry. We have to talk. And Juliet's like, actually, I'm good. So, so she leaves her ex a message saying, yes, I hope one day we can be friends, but I, we're not going to get back together. Uh, she and her mother make amends. Juliet goes back to Portland where Harlow tells her that she and Maxine have broken up. Uh, and that she's been jealous of Maxine's other partner and offers Juliet acupuncture as a sort of non-apology. Uh, Juliet talks to the to the people of color like Maxine about Harlow and eventually confronts her, uh, telling her how much that whole thing hurt her, how racist she'd been, how Juliet felt guilty for not saying anything, but that Harlow's work was important to her. Then she has a moment in the river, because this all happened over a hike, uh, where she accepts everything she's learned, all what the women have taught her, and how much she still has in front of her, and she takes a breath. Um, and she returns home with writing ideas in mind. And that's where it ends. So there are a lot of big themes in this book. Uh, one of the biggest is feminism. Here's a quote from the opening from the letter that Juliet writes to Harlow. But I'm writing to you now because this book of yours, this magical labia manifesto, has become my Bible. It's definitely a reading from the book of white lady feminism, and yet there are moments where I see my round brown ass in your words. I wanted more of that, Harlow, more representation, more acknowledgement, more room to breathe, the same air as you. We are all women. We are all of the womb. It is in that essence of the moon that we share sisterhood. That's you. You wrote that and I highlighted it, wondering if that was true. If you don't know my life and my struggle, can we be sisters? Can a bad white lady like you make room for me? Should I stand next to you and take that space? Or do I need to just push you out of the way? Claim it myself now so that one day we'll be able to share this earth, this block, these deep breaths. So I like that, like getting to the end when you know what happens both with Harlow, but also with the like taking a breath, that whole theme throughout that she she takes that breath at the end. And that does, you know, from the second you read it, you're like, oh, no, don't meet your heroes. <laughs> and then when you're like first introduced to Harlow, you're like, oh, no, 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 no. Like, ooh. Uh, which leads us to white feminism and racism, which is a big topic of discussion in this book. Uh, here's another quote. Harlow made it seem like those white girls had to give us something, I replied, turning my head up a little, like as if we couldn't do our thing without them. See, you get it, she said. She being Maxine here. Space isn't theirs to give to us, nor is Harlow separate from those girls. They are her. She is them. White allies need to keep that distance out of their community education. Damn, but like at least she said something, right? I asked. Maxine raised an eyebrow, shaking her head. Her rich, full laugh wrapped me up. These sweet potatoes and mushrooms weren't chorizo and a side of tostones, but they were love. I joined in with my wheeze laugh. Her shoulders heaved up and down with each breath. She'd fit right in at the breakfast table back home. Maxine dabbed at her eyes with her napkin. In all love and seriousness, she slowed down and looked me square in the eye. You know just saying something is good enough until it isn't at all. Um, so I think also going back to that first quote we read where she's talking about like taking space or like pushing out of the way uh, that harkens back to this, this moment and this quote. And... Um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of conversation about like microaggressions and tokenism and Maxine and Harlow's relationship is really interesting uh, where they seem to kind of push each other a lot 
that keep coming back to each other. Uh, but also it's like Harlow doesn't know so much about Maxine. <laughs> so it's a little, hmm. I think this all really just ta- takes place in understanding that because a lot of white feminists take under the pressure that they must be a savior. And she does talk about being a savior and having that savior complex, which, you know, anybody who is marginalized knows this feeling that people who come in with like, I have to stand up for you and I'm going to do this for you. And I and and if they're not getting the appreciation they think they deserve, then they feel like they're the next victims. They're the victims of this situation. And that's what Maxine talks about. Like, this is why you this is what you're doing. You're not doing this to be an ally. You're doing this to get uh, to be the center of the conversation again. And that's that level because two white girls complained that the space that they had gone to an event was for black and brown people and that white people were welcome to join, of course, but this was not their space. This is for them to observe. And then two white girls complained about like, why can't it just be all about every, you know, all of us as is unity. And this was always the problem to begin with because when it's quote unquote all of us, it means white centered privilege, white centered problems. And again, leaving out any marginalized person, specifically black people uh, and black and brown people in general. And we're talking about like the black community and the Latino community as a whole, because we know that's the depth of the racism and that there's this layer of privilege. And that Harlow, once again, thinking that she was being a savior, coming to the rescue without hearing, without speaking up, without actually taking time to learn. And that's that bigger level of like, see what I did for you? kind yeah. of thing. Um, and Harlow does that again later where she's like, of course, I'm the big bad white uh, white lady mm-hmm. you know, that can't do anything. Again, centering herself in that conversation instead of listening about what is going on. Magazine talking about, and I, I get this, taking any scrap of what seems like goodwill and really like, and, and same thing with obviously um, Juliet learning about feminism and this is someone who is a feminist who really loves her body as a woman and then like coming in as like not being in love with a man and not being centralized around men. So this is kind of that uh, elementary level an introduction to feminism. So you get really, really enthralled by that and really excited and you want to run with that because it's something new for you. Right. But when you start, and Maxine was the same way. She was like, she kind of said she was worried about Julia doing the same thing Maxine did, being enthralled with this woman who seemed like such an open-minded genius of her time, mm-hmm. quote unquote. And then as you start really unfolding all the layers, you realize, oh, but it's absolutely one-dimensional. Absolutely. It stops at her privilege. It stops at what she gets and she's done. And mm-hmm. that's that same level. Again, with like white feminism, when we talk about it, is they don't want to go beyond when they get their rights. It's their, they go and get it first. And then we'll, we'll focus on everything else instead of seeing the underlying issues. And that's what she's talking about. Maxine is talking about specifically here is like, she's getting what she wants. She wants to be the hero. She wants to be the savior. This is not actually being uh, a good um, ally, a good comrade in this conversation. And I think it really opens up Juliet's eyes, who hasn't had any feminism point blank, Mm -hmm. and realizing, oh, this may not be the route. Like her saying that she's an ally doesn't mean she's an ally. And then seeing her cousin, which I know we'll talk about, who has like been fully inundated in that world as well, but from a Latino cultural background. Like she's coming at like being a feminist and what it looks like as a brown person, as a Latina person Mm -hmm. and uh, understanding the depth of colonization that happened to Puerto Rico and why inherently (laughs) white people can't be trusted. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I mean, I'm going to say that out blank because that's kind of that level is like the heroine that she thought Harlow was actually ended up being someone who was just as aggressive, just microaggressive in the ways that she was being welcomed into this community. Right. And I feel that it was such a great depiction of, um, because we've talked about this, when you go to college and you realize like, oh, I didn't know about this or, oh, I didn't know about this. And you want to learn more. And um, Juliet is such a fun character in that way because she's she describes herself as very bookish, mm-hmm. like she wants to learn more. She gets this list of um, books, book suggestions from Ava and like seeing her learn more about her culture and what happened and like the confrontation she has with her white girlfriend about Banana Republic. Yeah. I was like, yeah, (laughs) it was just it felt very 
that experience of when you go to college and just you meet people and they open all these doors for you. And sometimes they've been there that whole time and you've just never asked them the question. Right. Um, which sort of ended up being the case with Ava, who, yes, we will talk about. I love that. But yes, uh, so Harlow at this reading is um, asked a question about, you know, intersexual feminism essentially, but, you know, uh, including people of color and what she's doing for that. And she uses Juliet as a token and paints her life completely inaccurately and completely racistly about like she got out of the Bronx and it, you know, was very violent and difficult and all that stuff. And that wasn't her life <laughs> at all. Her poor area. And they're like, yeah. <laughs> no, they lived in a nice area. They actually were really happy. She was went to college. She's fine. <laughs> There's right. none of that was a conversation. I don't understand. <laughs> right. Um, so Juliet goes to Miami after that. She's so upset. Then she comes back with all this, you know, like newfound knowledge and they go on this hike and Juliet confronts Harlow. And here's a quote from that. That's not enough. I continued holding the tree I just kicked. And what sucks is that I know that you know that deep down, you also know you get a pass. Maybe not from Maxine and Zyra, but from every white lady in that room. All of them just looked at me all sad, like as if they were ready to discover their own little lesbian Latina from whatever hood and make themselves a savior too. Right. Yeah. But also like, and I think it's something to be noted, at the very beginning of the book, you meet Finn, who is a Filipino uh person, young person that uh, lived with her. And obviously, from what we gathered, the, his mom was in a relationship with Harlow. They all lived as a family and then his mom just left. So he has a lot of feelings and he was very antagonistic to uh, Juliet. And I think it has something to do with the fact that it is very much Harlow being like, I'm going to collect these people of color to save mm -hmm. them. And it was a big hint at the very beginning of what this was. Like, he really has a huge savior complex uh, in being this goddess fairy for each one of them and showing them the way without understanding, like, hey, you're actually in the way uh, yeah. at this point. Like, you are a part of the, you are the problem in this conversation. You, like, collecting literally marginalized people for your crew of followers we don't know what you're, do what you're doing and obviously she very much say says that out loud during that moment of like look what I've rescued as if she as if Juliet was a puppy from a pound and mm -hmm. Juliet finally like she's having and I loved I loved how well uh Riviera played this in that insecurity of finding your voice because you know you're too insecure to speak up because you're just learning and you know you're in a powerhouse full of people who have been in this world for a long long time also you're in Portland and I can't imagine the like juxtaposition of being from the Bronx coming to Portland because yeah. I, I couldn't imagine myself. But like having that and then trying to figure out your voice, being 19 with all these middle-aged women who are talking so many new terms, whether it's polyamory or whether it's about um, gender pronouns. And this was in the early 2000s. So this is my age range. I was like, oh, this is lovely. This I know this. I know this feeling of being new and traveling by myself or being somewhere new by myself in the early 2000s, trying to figure it out where everybody was somewhat accepting, but there was no actual terms for things. Like it was all very new and it was so new that people were scared of it. Like this was during that time. And so I loved seeing that perspective that she put on to her character, Juliet, which she understood very well because she was like walking into a whole new environment completely and trying to learn. So I was trying to find their voice. And that soul like moment with Maxine where Maxine's like, you knew something was off, but you didn't know how to phrase that. You don't know what is off. And I think, I, I again, I, I'll talk about, like, I feel that way when people are saying things to me like, your English is really good or all these things. And I'm like, this feels off. Mm -hmm. I know you're trying to be nice to me and you're trying to get to know me, but in a weird way, because you would not ask any white person this question. So I'm very confused, um, especially with my accent anyway. But like, 
her learning all these levels, but not being able to say it because you're just trying to fit in. You're trying to be appreciative of being noticed or being talked to, being like being a part of something in general. So like having her come to that point of being like non-pissed, you know you're wrong. And you know that in between this, if they saw this, they would paint me as the aggressive person, again, from the hood as you try to put me, uh, while you are just being so nice and kind and helping a young girl out. Like, that's literally the picture that you portrayed, and you know how wrong that is, and you have not said, I'm sorry, and you've not made a public uh, apology and understanding and admitting that you are wrong. As, in fact, you've, like, doubled down by saying, look, I'll introduce you to another Latino person. Uh, You're welcome. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I found one of your kind, essentially, is what she's saying. And I want to put this in here, and I know I'm going to get some people get real mad at me when I say this. But in conversations, when you see this of people with good intentions and you are a person of marginalized community and you are trying to come in and figure yourself out. And I say this as a person who's trying to figure myself out. There are moments when you kind of wish that you're like, I have too many white people in my life. <laughs> and you're like, I'm going I'm to have to I'm going to have to back off because instead of. Trying to help you discover who you are in this whole space, in this space of intersectionality, they try to tell you how they're going to help you, but it's all, again, white-centered. And this is what Harlow was doing to Juliet. And thank God Juliet was able to meet Maxine and Zara, as well as her uh, new flame, which I'm sure we're talking about, Kira, of seeing different perspectives on what was happening because she needed that to unfold the rest of what was missing in her life, like the rest of the un, like learning and unlearning that she needed to do. And her own uh, cousin, Ava, thank God, was is a part of that too. And they, how much they realized with each other, like they really are have common ground and maybe even her little brother that we find out later on. And I think that's beautiful. But that this is that conversation that is so real to me that I'm like, yeah, yeah, it kind of gets to the point of like, White allies mean well, but they talk so much that they don't realize this is more hindrance. And this is where white feminism gets in the way. Listeners, I love if you are a white person, please don't think this that I'm saying this as an attack. But just coming from an all white space as I have, and I'm telling you, it's an all white space as in like my family and all of that, you realize what boundaries that they put in front of you or sometimes, you know, what kind of um, obstacles I put in front of you because of their good intentions. But it doesn't, it's not, it's not in the end that great. And this is where we see with Harlow as well. I thought it was really interesting that this book, when I looked up when it came out, I was like, really, January 2016? Because presumably had been written before that, but that is when we had the Women's March, and that was, you know, uh, rightfully called out for being white women wearing these pink pussy hats and sort of like pushing other people out. And because of the, the title of Harlow's book, um, and has put in the name. I just assumed, and maybe it did, because that that's that was around before that March. But I was just like, the timing is very interesting. Right. With that. I think she was definitely making sure to a not only be a little bit autobiographical in, in her own uh, story, but to also really, she, I mean, she does it in a genuinely good way. That I, again, I read into this, and I think it probably a little bit differently in that level because in seeing her come to terms with what she uh, she was seeing because in her own again I grew up being told that I was being saved by white people so that wasn't new to me it was her trying to let go of the fact that I'm like I gotta stop like falling into that for her to be seen as that it was so new because she has a very strong very influential family Puerto Rican family who have held her up in those traditions like she talks about the food feeling homey and she's like uh, loving it missing it missing the like being hugged by her mom and getting like the moments of like just being able to put her head and, and smelling her mom and knowing that she could be comforted that way like going to see her aunt and getting that hug that she needed because you know it was familial but all of that to say is like to see like her intentions of being like oh this is what 
the white community or like sees me as as someone that needs to be rescued. Who? What? What is this? And then not sure how to handle that because it's so new to her. Because mm-hmm. that was never a thought for her. And I, 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 and interesting enough, like she never saw that with Lainey because she thought Lainey, which uh, maybe I'm just putting words in my in her, in her like writing in that Lainey was that person also like both of them were experiencing new things but it seemed like because she said Sarah the new girl was probably a white girl and she now she's got to what she wants that she can show presentably Mm -hmm. as a better representation for being a a good feminist lesbian (laughs) and that meant being white uh, as, as she saw it as as like Juliet saw it and I'm like I think that and Lainey who was very very white you know, according to what we read, like that to me was like that was a new realization as well. And what she was to Lainey, possibly to what she was to the rest of the world as well. Like I think I found that interesting. I really think that for me, Riviera did a great job in showing that as showcasing the a new a new baby feminist, that she says, or a new <laughs> baby lesbian, as she says. Yes. And Lainey is the girlfriend that yes. they broke up. No, yeah, because Lainey didn't want to introduce, she was scared to introduce uh, Juliet to her, like, suburban white family. I think we were, we have a quote about that later. And then she meets Sarah, presumably, yes, white girl. And then she's not so worried about it anymore. But then I guess it didn't work out or either she, she panicked. But Juliet was in a good, she was in a better place. I was like, you know yes. what? I'm good. Um. <laughs> <laughs> she found her roots. She did. She said. <laughs> she did. Uh, I did want to include this quote. This is from when Ava and Juliet are just having their like amazing back and forth about feminism and thoughts about feminism uh, when Juliet goes to Miami. And one of the criticisms Ava has about the book is kind of the um, emphasis and preference. Uh, placed on like periods and all like that stuff. So here's a quote. Her consistent linking of genitals to gender as an absolute is violent as hell. It's a closed fist instead of open arms, you know? And besides, she added, staring at herself unflinching in the mirror, womanhood is radical enough for anyone who dares to claim it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Like Kira said that too. Kira said that she is very focused on women. Like she yeah. doesn't like she equates women and a vaginas in the story in this mm-hmm. and not allow for the in betweens and and just being like the goddess has been feminine which feminine could be all across all genders and we know this but like in general like she specifically aims to women equ- equating that the only way a woman is powerful is through their vagina and and uterus and it's, and again it is very problematic especially in a world where she is supposed to be a leader for the queer community and you're like you are leaving out a lot of the lgbtqia plus peoples and you uh are excluding when you're saying you don't want to exclude yes and you know you and i have talked before we talked recently not everyone who identifies as a woman has period for multiple reasons All right um and also like i do get we've talked about this too there is something in our culture and our society periods are taboo we don't talk about them I do get trying to like, let's talk about it. It's let's, I, there was period pride was a huge thing a while back. Mm-hmm. But in doing so, if you're like leaving out everyone else, if you're not, if that's your main focus and you're not talking about anyone else, then you're, yeah, you're excluding a lot of people. Right. A lot of people, which kind of leads us into the next theme I wanted to talk about because there is some. Um, there's uh, elements of homophobia in here of because clearly Juliet is how the book starts is she's really nervous about coming out to her family. And so she she's like actually going back and forth about whether she will at all. But then she finally does. It kind of just comes out of her like she says it and everyone kind of doesn't believe her or is like, oh, yeah, I've used that old excuse too. <laughs> like, but then she she says it outright after having a very sweet conversation with her little brother right where he's very like no you got this so she she does it and then like i said mixed results um but her mom was definitely the one that was the most like oh no this is not correct um 
So here's a quote from her mom. It's this book, isn't it? This book about vaginas has you messed up in the head and confused, she said, looking past me, anywhere but at me, her voice heavy but not angry. My father reached out for her hand and held it. No, it's not Raging Flower. I love Lainey. It's never felt like this with a boy, I said. Tears betrayed the tiny bit of strength in my voice. Little Melvin bowed his head low, his cheeks flushed. He nudged his knee into mine and kept it there. I pushed my plate of food aside. Mom and I stared at each other, and I felt like I was falling. But Juliet, she said, you've never had a boyfriend, so how would you know? All you know are these neighborhood boys. You haven't given any of the boys at your college a chance. You might like Lainey, but it's not the same thing. I promise you that. Love. I love her. You don't know anything about my feelings. So that's how it went. (laughs) And this was her, like, final night before she left. And I think, like, in that conversation, because this is a fairly quick read, I would say, packs in a lot. Um, mm-hmm. And a lot of the the stereotypes are kind of responses people get, in my experience, when coming out, that it's a phase you'll grow out of it. Mm-hmm. Of course. It's a trend. I do kind of... It, it cracks me up this whole like you read this book and now you're gay because that's what they use to like ban books a lot of times <laughs> where people because the percentage of LGBTQ plus people is higher than ever people think it's like books or whatever that's turning them gay but as we've said before it's it's more likely that they've just know this is a thing now <laughs> All right <laughs> and they might not have before Rivera has like a interesting comparison uh, where Juliet is thinking about not being Puerto Rican enough. Like how she'd gotten people saying she wasn't Puerto Rican enough for not liking or not knowing about certain music or about certain things and how having that experience made this make her feel like, oh, okay well, maybe I'm not gay enough. And then that's compounded when she goes to Portland and she learns all these new terms in the world of feminism. And like, maybe I'm not feminist enough, like all of those Mm -hmm. things. Right. I mean, in both of those situations, yeah, she's talking about being tested. Yeah. And then we've, I think we can know that when anything, we're like, I'm a fan of this band. And you're like, oh, you are? Well, tell me, name three songs. You know, like just (laughs) stuff like that that we see. But when it comes to your identity and you're like, what the hell? Why do I have to prove myself? I exist. Like, I'm (laughs) I'm, I'm here. I don't don't know how else to tell you. Like, I deal with the same microaggressions that you do and assumptions that you do. I literally, I laugh because the other day I had someone ask me if I like being here. And this is y'all, this is for real. And I was like, what do you mean? You mean? Like, where? What now? And I kind of bypassed that question. Then he asked me again, like, do you, you like being here? And I said where? <laughs> Decatur? And then he was like, no, the U.S. And I was like, oh, uh, I've been here. Like, I, like, and he like tried to backtrack. And this was a younger dude. And I was like, are you, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to get my car washed. I'm not really sure where that came from, but okay. Uh, but like being tested and being told that at the same time being like, but you're not really like that, that level of conversation, the same way with feminism is like, but are you, do you support these things or do you not support these things? Or do you devote this way? Have you done these things? Are you part of these activism? Are you like, are you marching you in the streets every book? day? Like, yeah. <laughs> have you like a boycotted all these things? Like you, there's so many levels of like, you have to prove yourself. And it's, not good enough for most people. And there's different levels of what constitutes you being enough of these are things. And she says that. And then I kind of wanted to go back to about how the whole the phase you grow, you'll grow out of it. Because I really loved the auntie line in which she, you know, the daughter, Ava, is like, Mom, you're bi too? We're both bi? Are you kidding me? And the aunt laughs and says, yeah, I guess that's what it is. We're bi. It's meaning that even though her sister... Uh, Juliet's mom was like, your 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 aunt went through a phase two and liked this girl. And the aunt was like, no, I loved her. I loved this woman, but it didn't work out. And that hasn't changed the fact that I still love her today. As in, like, I have not changed from being bi. Mm-hmm. I just am with a man, which is what we see so often in the bi community. I know, Annie, that you uh, have talked about this rep- like we've talked about this repeatedly about the fact that just because you see them, you see someone in a hetero uh, relationship does not change that they are queer. Like they still are bisexual. And that kind of the auntie was like, no, yeah, I'm bi. 
Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And like all of them hugging together, loving each other and being like the even though the mom really thought she had Juliet with this point in actuality, right. the aunt was like, no, I haven't changed. I'm bye. I just yeah. didn't know the word for it. I just am who I am, essentially, is what they were com- like having that conversation. But I really loved that was a confirmation for Juliet of being like, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. And it's not a face. Like, I don't see that as a face either, which is still really, really, really offensive in every way. It is. <laughs> uh, here's another quote. It says, Titi Wepa didn't move. She stared hard at me and said, you were born in the middle of the night on a Monday, September 6, 1983. I'll never forget that day as long as I'm living and breathing. My brother came out of the delivery room first time in my life I'd ever seen him cry and told us you were a baby girl. Titi wiped her eyes. I've loved you from that moment and I always will. I don't care if you're gay or if you shave your head or or if you become a falcon, offered Lil Melvin from the back seat. Titi Weppa laughed. Or if you become a mother f-ing falcon, I'm your Titi and nothing will ever change my love for you. Yeah. I really wish we had more scenes with Melvin, Lil Melvin, to be honest. He yeah. was fantastic. He's the little brother and he's like a nerd but wonderful. <laughs> but I mean, nerd, wonderful. that sounds like we're nerds aren't wonderful. He's like a really sweet, like, speaks wisdom nerd. Yeah, he's a smart little brother who adores his sister beyond anything else. Not surprised by anything. She comes out to him first, and mm-hmm. he's like, yep, okay, you're an animorph. <laughs> which is a yeah. great, which is a great thing. And then he gives her an emergency pack for her to open when things are bad and it's perfect for her but like I love their relationship so much and how much they love each other and how much they support each other and even him being like seven years younger I think it's like 12 or 14 Mm -hmm. uh, and she's like 19 that he is like the support system she needs which is phenomenal so good yeah he's he's great he was he was reading Animorphs when you're first introduced to him and I love how he just accepts He's just like, yep, that's who you are. Um, it's like, oh, I might be gay too. <laughs> yeah, in the story. <laughs> in his letter. I love it. It's so good. <laughs> 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 I did want to speak to going back to that kind of like, you're not enough worry uh, when it comes to to I think a, a lot of things, but in this case, like being queer, but also like the whole feminist thing we've been talking about when you don't know the terminology. Um, here's a quote. You know, I didn't know the words. No, I didn't know my gender pronouns. All the moments where I was made to feel like an outsider in a group that was supposed to have room for me added up and left me feeling so much shame. Burning hot cheeks, eyes swollen with tears that were all the words I couldn't say. That's what my shame looked like. And I think like going back to so many other conversations we had, just like any other uh, group of people, there are biases within the queer community. And um, yeah, if you're new to it, it can be really scary when people are like, have you read this? Do you know this? Do you know this term? What is this? And so when she's kind of bombarded with all of these things she's never heard of. And then that can make you feel even more doubt. Like, oh, I didn't even know about that. <laughs> but right. as you said, when she goes to visit her aunt and cousin in Miami, she's like, oh, yeah, I didn't know that was a word for it. But, yep. <laughs> <laughs> I love the relationship. Mm-hmm. It goes on, your one job is to just accept what a person feels comfortable sharing about themselves. No one owes you info on their gender, body parts, or sexuality. Yeah. I liked that. There was also discussions around sexism. Uh, One of the opening scenes, I would say, pretty much is around that. And around, like, she describes herself as sort of a bigger brown queer woman. And having, having shame around, like, the clothes she wears or her body. But a lot of times, like, there's a pretty... There's a scene in the beginning where she's confronted by neighborhood dudes who are just doing that horrible harassment do thing (laughs) that some dudes do. And she has a quote where she's like, you know, I felt so good in the morning when I put this on. I felt so cute. And now I feel gross and wrong and weird. 
because it was like a a halter top that was showing off her breast and like tight pants and all this. And she felt really good about it. But then they came and harassed her and then she felt bad about it. And so she does have a lot of things in here about discussions of feeling overweight, of sweating like a normal human person. But a lot of us can relate to <laughs> being told that's like not ladylike. Oh, no. And having a lot of anxiety around that. And as you mentioned, I, 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 I just read an article about this, but it's been around forever. But I just read an article about how so many times when you see queer people in the media, it is kind of the straight white version of like the nice queer person who is in a woman's case. She's thin, she's white. Like she's still like traditionally beautiful to heterosexual people, which is a huge conversation. There's a lot of things to unpack there. Um, But her having anxiety around that and not fitting that when she's coming out. And she did get some of these anxieties from her family. And I related to to this quote. (laughs) Um, Nina, from now on, you must always wear a bra. Your breasts will get bigger like mine and grandma's. You must protect them. Trust me, eventually you will need the support as well. Men in public or even in the house should never be able to see the outline of your tatitas or the poke of your nipples. Put your bra on the second you wake up in the morning. Men can't handle seeing those things. It makes them crazy. Remember, they're just not as smart as we are, mama. From now on, you must shower every day and always wear deodorant and perfume. I do not want my little girl to be stinky. You are too pretty for that. Well, I feel like a lot of us had this talk where it was all of a sudden like, <laughs> you got to smell nice and you got to wear this and you can't wear this. And I was not allowed. I, I had to talk in my house. I was not allowed to go out without a bra. And I hated bras. So it was just really annoying. But then it kind of gets in your head of like, oh, yeah, men can't control themselves. And when, which I'm saying in terms of what people are telling you. And then when she, Juliet, is about to have her her coming out situation with her family. She describes the harassment incident she'd gone through with these dudes. And some of the people at the table were like, oh, it means he likes you. Or, oh, it means, yeah, <laughs> that's just them, whatever. So that was just something I when I was reading, I was like, yep, yeah, heard this one. And then this one's kind of a, a big mess of a theme. But I did pick up on some some big ideas about religion and belief systems. So obviously there was kind of the the white hippie aura thing that Harlow was doing that was very about like our auras have to sink and the moon and all of this this kind of stuff that was that was present throughout. So here's a quote. Uh, The only thing we can really do, Juliet, is to develop our own sustainable theodices. You know, we need to create our own understanding of divine presence in a world full of chaos. My God is black. It's queer. It's a a symphony of masculine and feminine. It's Audre Lorde and Slater Kinney. My God and my understanding of God are centered on who I am as a person and what I need to continue my connection to the divine, Maxine explained. She took a long breath. It's everyone's job to come up with a theodicy, one that has room for every inch of who they are and the person they evolve into. Yeah. So, yes, that is Maxine, not Harlow. But that was when they were talking about, like, belief systems. and Right. Because she was, has a master's in divinity. Yes. And so Harlow's world is about goddesses and auras, while uh, Juliet came from a pretty Catholic background. But she also believed in God and and really had a hard time in separating that. And I feel like that's so many people in religion, because I know, like, especially in the South, there's definitely a lot of, like, of the gay community who profoundly love their Christian community or their church community or their worship community. And, like, they have a connection to it on a different level. But like when, of course, like when you're being told this is against some, something, you are against our beliefs, you know, they have a hard time, but they still don't believe that's what God is to them or who God really is. And I think that's that breakdown of like trying to figure out for yourself right, what your beliefs are and spirituality is. Yes. And uh, Juliet did have her 
despite her upbringing, her doubts. Um, here's a quote. I was suspicious of the Bible. It had never been particularly forthcoming when it came to stories about women. Mary Magdalene wasn't really a hooker and Eve didn't force Adam to eat that apple. What did painting women as untrustworthy or whorish have to do with God's love anyway? Those stories weren't even about women directly. They were stories about men in which women had side roles as the mother or the second wife or the daughter for sale. The fact that I grew up in a religious household and had never heard of Sophia further proved to me that the people interpreting the Bible were misogynist and didn't care about anything a wise woman had to say. Christianity wasn't budging an inch on this quest of mine. So this is, as we said, the new task that Harlow gave to Juliet was tracking down women from these scraps of paper. Sophia was one of those women, and she, honestly, great curious researcher, just kind of started looking into the history of the name and found mm -hmm. out it meant like wisdom and found this biblical story that she'd never heard. And honestly, I hadn't heard, so. Right. There's so many things, like when I tell you researching like actual theology and then talking about like the sea scrolls and all the, you know, all of the things and what came later and then about the Apocrypha. So I don't know like all of that and the additional books that were left out. You start questioning why things were left out and who was being left out and why the amount of like information being taken away. And you're like, who decided this? Oh, a bunch of men. Okay. That's interesting. And then you're trying to figure out finding those pieces and going back to it because they try to destroy so many things because they didn't like people. <laughs> yep. They liked power, but not the people. Mm -hmm. And going back to that, that's pretty related. Uh, I did see a lot of themes of like gatekeeping in this, of gatekeeping of feminism or being queer or whatever, uh, based in terminology. Like, as we've said earlier, what you know, what you've read, what you, all of that stuff. And as part of this, she does get that list. And she, as you mentioned, she starts learning more about Puerto Rico that she had never learned in her American schooling. And she learns about colonization. And here's a quote about that. Maybe America just swallowed all of us, including our histories, and spat out whatever it wanted us to remember in the form of something flashy, cinematic, and full of catchy songs. And the rest of us, without that firsthand knowledge of civil unrest and political acts of disobedience, just inhaled what they gave us. So, yeah, like going back to what you were saying with religion, it, it's a very similar. <laughs> this is what we'll put in here uh, for you to learn. But otherwise, <laughs> no. Right. When you start looking at the history of Puerto Rico and what they're trying to do, and then you start looking at the uh, history of Hawaii and what they've done, and like, you kind of really question, like, oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hard transition. Dating. Uh, <laughs> the theme of dating in this. Uh, here's a quote. I couldn't even with dudes lately. All they did was talk smack about how good they laid down the pipe. Anytime I ignored them, I was both a bitch and all of a sudden too ugly or too fat to get it anyway. Neighborhood dudes sure knew how to slime and shame a girl in one swift move. Reason number 551, Raging Flower, was so necessary. Reading helped me gather myself, reminded me that I had a right to be mad. It felt like my body was both overexposed and an unsolved mystery. So this is after, yeah, her encounter with the harassing dudes in the beginning. Um, but I just thought that was a great quote about, yeah... You're, you're super hot until you don't want to have sex with them. And then you're like the ugliest thing that's ever existed. You're right. Every time. Yep. Every time. Didn't want you anyway. And then why right. are you talking to me? I didn't want this. Why right. are we here? I, I definitely didn't talk to you. I didn't de definitely didn't come to you. So mm -hmm. go away. Uh, yeah. And it goes on. Her heart felt far away from mine. Like they were beating in different time zones or different dimensions of love. I should have asked her for her to fight for us and to shed some f***ing tears over a summer apart. If I was going to spill my truth to my family, then so should she. But I didn't have those words. Didn't even know I wanted those things until after she was gone. All I wanted was her in my arms all night. But the clanking of dishes, the smell of stale coffee, and the absolute hetero vibe of Westchester kept me so aware of how unattainable that was. Where could our type of love grow anyway? Yeah, so that was with Lainey. Uh, her ex, who she, like, loved and made this, like, mixed CD for. She kept calling it a mixtape, but I think it was a CD. 
<laughs> it was. It was a CD, but like you call it a mixtape. Yeah. Like that's the old throwback, especially from our generation. She's born 1983. Yes. Yes. We called okay. it a mixtape. I was confused. Okay. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But this was another area where uh, Juliet didn't feel like she could speak up or she was questioning Am I being too much? Am I asking too much? Am I being too needy? All of those things. Which, reading it, and I'm someone who has those questions as well, I was like, no, this is... She would not respond mm-hmm. to your text. You can't respond to a text. A phone right. call, okay, but... And then she got mad at her. It's like, just call me one emergency. Yeah, that's, and I'm like, no, that's, that's rude. That's rude. Yeah. Not good. Um, She's yeah. toxic. Laney needed to go. And she did. And good for Juliet for being like, you know what? I hope you have a happy life. I hope you have a night like mine that I just had, but we're good. (laughs) Discover yourself. (laughs) Yes. There are also uh, conversations around poly dating and what that looks like. There's the big breakup that happens that we, a lot of us, I feel, can relate to and how miserable you feel and can't take a shower and you don't want to eat and all that stuff. Also, family, huge theme in this. I did want to shout out all the nerd references. And now that I know <laughs> Rivera writes for Marvel, I'm like, yep. <laughs> 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 Love it. But I do think one of the biggest themes that kind of weaves through all of this is seeking advice from other women. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that stood out to me is when... Juliet gets her period and like stains the sheets at Harlow's house. She has like the memory of her mom helping her with her period. And then what Harlow does, which is essentially like get in the bathtub and relax. And here are some organic tampons. And here's some tea, which, you know, not bad. I'm not saying, but it was like a difference. It was a stark difference. (laughs) This reminded me of an incident in which I was in Brooklyn and we were hanging out with a lot of hippie-ish people. Um, They were, they they went dumpster diving to get a chunk of their food because they're like, you know, Whole Foods throws out so many things and it's so wasteful and all these things. And and I'm like, yeah, yeah, cool, cool, cool. They had the, you know, sign over their toilet. If it's yellow, let it mellow. (laughs) You know, like they literally, that's the, I was like, wow, people actually write this. Okay. Um, And I was like, I need, I needed a tampon. And she brought me an organic tampon. And this is the first time I'd seen one without an applicator. And I was like, oh no. (laughs) <laughs> what do I do with this? I was very, very confused. Uh, and I kind of just sat there and stared at it for a second. I'm like, and this was right, I was at the beginning of college. So around the same time frame as, as Julia would be going through her thing. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know what to, okay. And I tried to use it. I was not good with it because it was not something, like, you have to get used to like how comfortable you're with your body and like all these things. And like, Plastic applicators, even with those, I had to be like, they have to be silky and smooth. I couldn't even use the paper ones at that point. This is a lot of detail. But (laughs) I just remember that moment of like, yeah, but I could only keep it in for a little bit because I did not put it in far enough. Tampon users, you know, you know what I'm talking about. And so I was like, yep, nope. That was a good try, though. (laughs) (laughs) I just remember those moments of doing that as well as I loved... No offense to anybody in Portland. We love you. I'm sure it's not like this at all. But her talking about how the uh, transit smelled was so different because, like, everybody was all about, like, the no deodorant and, like, white people having dreads and not knowing mm-hmm. how to really care for it. Like, all these things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then all that smell. And she's like, yeah. The Bronx subway system was much better, like going from one smell to a different smell. And I was like, yeah, because when I went to this house with all of the people that I've like, I've never hung out with people like this, which I feel like I'm missing out. And I was really glad to meet them. They were very kind and sweet people. But like the, 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 those, that was a whole new experience. I was like, this is a different smell. <laughs> this is this body odor, fresh, no bathing, <laughs> no deodorant body odor is different. Is new. And like, I was like, okay, this is a whole different world. Like, (laughs) her Mm -hmm. her jumping into that world, it made me quite like, I was like, yup, I get it. (laughs) And like, that kind of experience for her to be like, 
all right, what is happening? I just want you to leave me alone. Quit telling me to love my period and to like embrace this. Like, what is this? I guess I'm at least at the same time. Like she was like, but wow, the way that you are like telling me thank you for bleeding on my mattress, that's a new level. Right. <laughs> and <laughs> Juliet was like, I could just, you have like Tylenol. <laughs> Harlow was like, you don't need that. Here's what we'll do. <laughs> We're going to fix it with the, the breathing. And it for worked. what it was worth in, in the book, Juliet, for her, it worked. She pa- yeah. Like, I will say, so something to being like in a nice bath and being catered for, like, that's lovely. Yeah. I don't want to, again... It was just the difference between was right. like, oh, kind of telling. The crash course when you're from yeah. one world to another and trying to like, I yes. eventually was able to use the ones with the applicators, FYI. It okay. just took like the newness of it. Yeah. It was like a whole thing. And that's kind of this thing. It was like for her to get this newness and then like just jumping into a different type, like different way of doing things. Right. Right. Um, but I did enjoy like, Going back to the theme of the, the, like all these women, she does have, as you mentioned, memories of her mom often or her aunt often, um, her cousin of having like these women in her life that were giving her advice, whether it's the best advice or not in this case. But, you know, having that and then the research she was doing reflected that as well. While she was looking at these women, she was through that research learning about herself and in in some way getting almost advice or or like having her world open up and having questions that she hadn't previously asked. And one, as we've mentioned, I would say one of the biggest points of this was her cousin Ava, who just had been doing this research, was immediately like, you should be wary of this person, Harlow. Like, let me give you these books and come to Miami. And then when, when Juliet did, it was this huge, like asking questions and not being judged for it and just sharing this information and having this beautiful experience where Juliet wasn't so much in her head anymore. She was just like, I can just be curious and she's not going to judge me and I can learn these new things. And it was great. And again, I think there's something important to be about that different communities look different and that's okay. Like you do learn so much from that, from different areas and whether it relates to you one way or doesn't relate to you that way, it doesn't mean it's wrong. And I think that's a like a bigger point in the book as well. Like just because she felt like a stranger in one specific community and then she felt more home in another doesn't have anything to do with whether it was right or wrong. Like that something is being done right or being done wrong. Like it's it's this level of understanding who you are and your identity and like understanding that culture does make a difference and makes a play into what uh, you need to hear or what you need to see and how you need to feel like a part of something. Like that's that bigger conversation. Just because you're one thing doesn't mean that you fit into all these things. And I, I mean, like, in general, just because she was gay doesn't mean she fit into, like, all the communities. It, and it, it shouldn't have to be that way. Like, we are individual people. That's the level of intersectionality, that there are several layers to who you are as a person. And I think that's something to remember. But it's also that she found everything beneficial. She learned so much about herself in those levels. And I think that's something that's really, really well uh, presented Yes, in this book. I do, too. Um, because also... Uh, going back to the confrontation she has at the end with Harlow, where she sort of accepts what's happened. She kind of, she finds her voice and she says something along the lines of like, you know, your book was so important to me, but this was about me. Like I found my voice. That was just one tiny part of it. And now I've found other people and now I'm going to write this story and I'm going to be a voice. And like, right. I think that was really well said. Like, Yeah. And it's wonderful because it opened a door. Like it literally yeah. opened her world to something and it was a portal, but it wasn't the end all. Like it's, it, it will be significant for her always, but it's not the impact and the, the Bible for her or like the instruction right. but book for her as it was at the, at the beginning. Like yeah. she's developing herself and creating her own. Yeah. Yeah. And like, having that realization I me mean, like okay that was like one part and now yeah there's all of this 
Um, and speaking of, I did think there was a powerful theme of transformation and rebirth in this. When she goes, Ava takes Juliet to a queer party for people of color. She gets a haircut. Uh, and it, it's just like a really empowering experience for her because I guess, uh, and I, I'm paraphrasing here, but she, it was like a queer haircut. Like she felt like it was like a, a queer haircut and she really liked yeah. it. And everybody yeah. was complimentary of it. Like everybody was like, wow, this looks amazing. And also transformation just on personal levels, like her family kind of like the people who weren't accepting her mother mainly kind of making this pledge to learn because they, they were all like, we love you, whatever happens, but we, we want to learn. And Juliet working to learn throughout all of this. And they have this conversation, her and her mom have this conversation about, like, what are you going to do now after the internship? And her mom brings up this conversation they had a while back. And here's a quote from that. You said reading would make me brilliant, but writing would make me infinite, which is a great quote. And here is another quote. All the women in my life are telling me the same thing. My story, my truth, my life, my voice. All of that had to be protected and put into the world by me. No one else. No one could take that from me. I had to let go of my fear. I didn't know what I was afraid of. I wondered if I'd ever speak my truth. But she did. She did. Um, and that, it was also very radical power of self-love at the end of like, nope, I'm worthy of telling my story and of being angry <laughs> and of having this voice. It was really, yeah, I really loved it. I thought it was great. It was very good. And like I said, I think it hit on so many different levels um, with her story, whether it's just about finding her identity, going out in the world from her like small corner to like what the bigger world looks like, seeing family connecting and then connecting on a different level that you didn't realize that you could have with your family and people around you. But yeah, it's like having that level and, and finding yourself once again, like she is finding new levels of herself. I love that. It grew from like, okay, I'm a feminist. Okay. I'm a lesbian. Okay. I'm an intersectional like lesbian. Okay. I'm a writer, intersectional lesbian, like all these levels where she really get to like explore herself, explore her loves, explore her identities. And yeah. I think it's also beautiful that she does talk about different levels of love. She talks about loving Harlow. She talks about loving um, Kira. She talks about loving Lainey. She talks about loving her mom, like these different levels of love that she felt and not wanting to deny any of those. But at the same time, like trying to deal with what that looks like for her and what those relationships were for her and appreciating that type of love. Like, I, I really genuinely love <laughs> all of that level that she had to those relationships. Yeah, I do, too, because it takes a lot of work to mm -hmm. recognize what a love did and then kind of compartmentalize like, OK, it was this important to me, but I can. I can move on from it, but also remember it. So yeah, definitely check it out if you haven't already. Uh, as always, if you have any suggestions for this segment, please let us know. You can email us at stephanieandmomstuff at iheartmedia.com. You can find us on Twitter at MomStuffPodcast or on Instagram and TikTok at Stuff I Never Told You. We're also on YouTube. We have a Public store and we have a book. You can get wherever you get your books. Thanks as always to our super producer, Christine, our executive producer, Maya, and our contributor, Joey. Thank you. And thanks to you for listening. Stuff I Never Told You is production by iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, you can check out the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 